do if I lived here is move. <laughs> then I would plan out the rest of my life after that. It's good to be here. I love uh, New Zealand, but I do wish it would warm up a little bit. So I want to, uh, you can stop now, thank you. Um, <laughs> I do want to explore with you this morning uh, strawberries. This is a subject that I'm fascinated with. Raise your hand if you like strawberries. All right. Let's pray together as we explore strawberries. Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the good God that you are. We invite you into our presence right now and, and ask that you would give us, Lord, I guess I, I'm asking for more than human understanding. Please open us up so that we can have some kind of supernatural realization of something that will transport us to a whole new level of understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I don't know if you know this guy, Dr. Christopher Ryan, but he has delivered one of the most popular, most viewed TED Talks in TED Talk history. Um, this thing has gotten millions of views. You will notice the rather provocative title. Is the screen working? Can you see anything? All right, so the rather provocative title, Are We Designed to be Sexual Omnivores? So his answer, the doctor's answer, and this is a TED Talk that is based on a book that he wrote, um, his answer to the question is, well, well, yes. And he's simply moving through a series of logical deductions. Because if you begin with the premise that we are merely evolving animals, okay, that's, that's the premise that he's beginning with. If we are merely evolving animals, well, that would mean then that there are no moral dimensions or parameters to reality whatsoever. We're just animals doing what animals do. And so when he poses the question, are we sexual omnivores, by which he means, are we designed biologically by the evolutionary process to just have sex with anybody we can find as often as we can find people to have sex with in order to propagate the species? I mean, the whole point here in the evolutionary theory of human uh, origins is that really what needs to happen is the species needs to survive. I mean, the basis of the idea is survival of the what? Survival of the fittest. And so this is the concept that lies at the foundation. And so he answers the question, yes. And there's a whole bunch of articles that have come out of this line of thinking in magazines like Psychology Today and uh, other scientific journals, essentially saying to women in particular who are in relationships with men, here's the message that's coming through, and, and I've collected these articles over about the last 20 years, and they're becoming more and more frequent, and here's the message to women now through the scientific journals. Do not expect your husband to be faithful to his marriage vows because he's an animal. And he is simply wired biologically to just find people to have sex with. Don't take it personal. Get over it. This is basically the message that is coming through that Dr. Ryan would have us believe and that is overtaking modern scientific understanding of the nature of man. Now, this is going in a direction that is intersecting with the rise of technology. So when you combine the worldview that I just described with easy access to literally every sex act imaginable, human beings are going to face what one magazine is calling the dating apocalypse. Now, Vanity Fair is not a Christian magazine. It's not a magazine with any moral scruples whatsoever, as far as I can tell. It's just a hedonistic, mainstream, secular magazine. And they have decided that they wanted to do some research and send out and deploy a bunch of journalists who would do kind of a state of the union assessment on what's going on with human beings on the level of the dating scene and 
human sexuality. And so it's very interesting that in September of 2015, that the cover article for Vanity Fair was Tinder and the dawn of the dating apocalypse. In other words, they're suggesting that what we're witnessing right now in Western civilization is the complete demise of the traditional dating system. And what they discovered in their research is extremely fascinating. Tinder, of course, is an app that you can get on your phone, and there's a number of them now that are available, and it's, a, it's, just, it's just a simple, simple technological method of finding someone. Now, dot, 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 finding someone for what is the question. Now, finding someone, and so you swipe, which way is it, right or, I can't remember if you want to hook up, is it right? Or, I, I, now, I'm not going to look at who knows. Somebody, somebody has this, this action mastered over here to my left. I don't know who you are. I, I did look. It's, which one is it? And it was a man's voice. Okay. I'm going to suggest that you develop ignorance regarding this technology. Okay, so Tinder is just a way of hooking up. So what this magazine, Vanity Fair, did is they began to send out journalists all over, mostly New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, places in the United States of America where I'm from. And this picture depicts what they were witnessing in the social scene, in clubs and restaurants and bars. And this is what they were witnessing. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words or more. What's happening here is you have human beings, young human beings, in the prime of life, who are all in one another's presence. There's an actual human right there next to me, and I'm on my phone, swiping right or left. And what the magazine reports is this, and I'm quoting from the article. Everyone, this is what the journalists are witnessing, everyone is drinking and peering into their screens, swiping on faces of... What's that word? Strangers they may have sex with later that evening or not. Swipe right, swipe left. Now check this out. John, a 26-year-old marketing executive in New York, was one of the people that the journalists interviewed. And sex, he says, has become so easy, I can go to my phone. This is John reporting to the journalist from Vanity Fair. I'll tell you what's going on, he says. In my world, as a 26-year-old Young man, sex has become so easy, I can go to my phone right now, and no doubt I can find someone to have sex with this evening, probably before midnight. One of the outcomes of this, I mean, you might call it a positive or a negative outcome, I mean, how do you sort these things, is that prostitution is on the decline. I mean, why would you pay for sex when all you have to do is swipe right? Or is it left? So all you need to do is swipe on your phone, and the point is this. John is telling us that in his world as a young man, currently in the state of human affairs, that sex is so easily accessible for him that by midnight he can just find somebody to have sex with. Now, the, one of the downsides to this is commitment to one person in an ongoing relationship is on the decline. Check this out. This is another person that the journalist found in one of the places that they were exploring. There is no dating, there's no relationships, says Amanda. If I remember correctly from the article, Amanda's like 22 years old, and she's simply saying, hey, in my world, as a 22-year-old girl, uh, relationships... Dating, well, that's just not a thing anymore in my world. We, we don't do that anymore. We don't date. We don't have relationships. Well, Amanda, what do you experience? Well, there's no dating, no relationships. They're rare. That is, dating and relationships, rare. You can have a, what she calls a fling, that could last like seven or eight months, and you could never actually call someone your boyfriend. I mean... This is something, but what is it? I mean, we've been together. Are we together? I don't know. Are we together? Are we dating? I don't know. Are we dating? Are you my boyfriend? Oh, don't call me that. Are you my girlfriend? I would like to be. What is this that we have going on for 
six, seven, eight, nine months. What is this thing? Well, Amanda says, well, he's not my boyfriend, and you can't call it a relationship, and don't you dare call it dating. And then she says this. This is one of the saddest lines in the article. Hooking up is a lot easier. This is Amanda. No one gets hurt. Amanda pauses. Well, not on the surface. What did Amanda actually just say? What did she actually just say? She just said there's a whole lot of hurt, but you're not supposed to get hurt. In this new system that we have going on, where you can swipe right or swipe left, in this new system that we have going on, where there's no dating and no relationships, hooking up is easier, Amanda? Is it, Amanda, is it, I wish I knew Amanda. Oh, I would love to sit down with Amanda. <laughs> I would say, Amanda, is it actually easier to be with a guy for seven or eight months and never call it dating? And Amanda, is it true that no one gets hurt? Well, Man Amanda is saying, kind of reading between the lines, she's saying, well, not on the surface. Well, if you're not hurt on the surface, where are you hurt? And then, New York Magazine, another very secular, hedonistic magazine that has no interest whatsoever in moral values, so, so they're not preaching anything. They're just journalists who are reporting what they're discovering. In the cover article, Sex on Campus, and what this magazine did is they sent out journalists to American campuses, college and university campuses, and they discovered what they are calling and what is generally understood to be hookup culture. That's their language, not mine. Now, hookup culture is defined in this article as meaningless sex with strangers. Hookup culture is defined in the secular magazine's article as meaningless sex with strangers. And then the magazine gives a more extended definition of what they're calling hookup culture. The script, according to this ritual, is first you have sex, then perhaps you date. Or more likely, you just continue hooking up, creating a long-term relationship minus what? Minus feelings, and then notice that the article rather insightfully after the comma, adds the word what? Theoretically. Theoretically. A relationship minus feelings, theoretically, out of a series of one-night stands. So what's happening here is sex is occurring, but sex is occurring in the context of no feelings, at least you're not allowed to have feelings, according to this script, don't you dare feel anything. Because if you feel anything, you're going to get hurt. So don't begin to get attached, according to this narrative, according to this new script, this non-relationship, non-dating, sex without, what's the word again? Feelings. Now I want you just to feel for a moment the cognitive dissonance of that proposition. Sex without feelings. Just feel it for a minute. What the hell is that? That's my question. Sex without feelings? Really? Okay, well, sex minus feelings really equates to sex without love, which really is sex without commitment. Now track with me. I'm going to suggest to you that from a physiological standpoint, I'm not going to preach anything to you. I'm not going to try to prove anything to you from the Bible. I'm not going to tell you that God wants you to do anything. I'm not going to impose any kind of moral code on you. I'm just going to tell you that the hard science of physiology intersecting with psychology teaches very clearly, apart from any moral mandate from Scripture, that sex without love kills the human capacity for pleasure. 
So let me say it to you this way. Let me back up. Let me back up here and say it from a different angle. If your goal is pleasure, and who doesn't want some pleasure? If you really want pleasure, the way to get it is to not engage in the prevailing narrative or script of the culture of attempting the impossible by engaging in sex without feelings, sex without commitment. And I'm going to suggest to you that the secular data is pointing in this direction apart from any kind of religion imposing these ideas on us. So the New York Magazine article goes on to say, some of what we learned as they deployed their journalists around the world or around the country in the United States to all these university campuses, some of what we learned was unexpected. It appears to be the case that faced with either hookups or nothing, and again, what is hookups? What is the definition in the article of hookups? Meaningless sex with strangers. Sex without commitment, okay? It appears to be the case that faced with either hookups or nothing, that many students are simply opting out of college sex. Nearly 40% of the respondents to our polls were virgins. This is the highest percentage in recorded American history of virgins at the college level age, at the university level age. In other words, the article is saying, wow, this is really strange what we've discovered. Virginity in college is on the rise. Why? You are at the prime of your sexual virility. The chemicals are going off in every direction inside of you. Why would somebody in their 20s, for example, simply choose not to have sex if it's available to them? So the magazine, this secular magazine, finds this to be somewhat of a conundrum. I mean, what's going on here? Why would that be the case? Why would virginity be on the rise? Well, it's as if the sexual, it's as if sexual freedom has become a burden as well as a gift. And here's the burden. Here's the burden. The burden is this. That the human being is a holistic creature that is designed for something more than mere sexual release on a physical level. Being a holistic creature, even if we don't know why, and most of these college and university students don't know why, they're just saying, uh, no thank you, I don't want to have meaningless sex with strangers. I'm opting out of hookup culture. And there's a movement, I don't know if it's happening here, but in the United States, there is this, this incredible rise of young people who are identifying as asexual. That is to say, I have friends, young friends in my church who are, who are members of my church who when I've had conversations with them, they've said, I'm asexual, which is to say, I don't have any interest at all in sex with anybody for any purpose, forget it. No interest. So then when I ask them, so what are you interested in? Oh, what I'm interested in is conversations. I want to get to know a person. I want friendship. So what's happening is a kind of, please understand my language in quotation marks here, a kind of overcorrection where the hookup culture of sex without love is leading a lot of young people to say, I don't want sex if it doesn't include love. No, thank you. And they're just backing up from it and saying, I'm opting out of this system, this no relationship, no dating, no feelings, you're not my boyfriend, but what are you kind of script I'm opting out. So this is going in a direction that is very fascinating because New York Magazine, Vanity Fair Magazine, these aren't the only secular journals that are commenting on this. GQ Magazine, which by any estimation is not a magazine with high moral standards. This is the most hedonistic men's journal on the planet. This is a magazine that is devoted almost entirely to the exploitation of the female form, the objectification of the female body for male pleasure. That's what the magazine is, just short of porn. 
And in an article written by Scott Christian in GQ magazine, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing these are secular journals. These people are not Christians. They could care less about any kind of moral standard. God's not talking to them. They're not talking to God. There's nothing going on religious here. They're just looking at it from a purely scientific standpoint. They're looking at the sociology, the psychology, and the physiology. Are you with me so far? And this magazine, GQ, published an article not too long ago titled 10 Reasons Why You Men, they're addressing men, should quit watching porn. 10 Reasons Why You Should Quit Watching Porn. Well, let me tell you what the reasons aren't of the 10. Because God doesn't like it. You won't be saved. You're going to Adventist hell. <laughs> Those aren't any of the reasons. Not even it's wrong. Not one of the 10 reasons is you should stop watching porn because it's wrong. Stop it. Or your mom would not be proud of you. None of that is in the 10 reasons. I'm going to give you, I think, three of the 10 reasons, but first a little introduction that the author of the article gives to what he's trying to say to us. This is quoting from the article. He says, with the ubiquity and easy access to porn these days, it shouldn't come as a surprise that people are beginning to study the effects on it, of it on our sex lives. So, so what is the author of this article interested in? What's this article interested in? I mean, if you were to say this guy has a motive, what's his motive? Are you tracking with the grammar here? What's he interested in? He's really alarmed, but what's he alarmed about? He's saying, we need to be careful, men, because our sexuality is at stake here. He doesn't have any kind of high moral standard. He's just saying, whoa, wait a minute. Porn is having an effect on our sex lives. Hmm, maybe we should question this. Well, the first reason that he gives is very interesting. He says 420 million web pages are dedicated to porn, meaning that the non porn internet roughly consists of, well, Wikipedia. <laughs> he essentially goes on in the article to say that the internet basically exists for porn. And then there's a few other articles that you can read, but they're all pretty boring. This is the point of the article. Scientists at Cambridge University recently studied the brain scans of porn addicts and found that they looked exactly like those of drug addicts. So this is a very serious problem that the article, that the author of the GQ article wants to give us, and with such an inexhaustible supply of porn at our disposal, there's a growing concern that it is beginning to affect our, check this out, this is what he's concerned about, our brains, our relationships, and even our bodies. Note the language, even our bodies. No Christian agenda, no moral agenda. And so, number one, for this hedonistic GQ journalist, he's saying, men, you should stop watching porn because if you keep watching it, you're going to experience, number one, arousal, declines in your life. Well, going back to that original article by, in Vanity Fair, you remember Amanda? Well, there are parts of the article I didn't quote to you where Amanda said to the journalists who were interviewing, Amanda and other young ladies in their 20s said, it's really strange what we're witnessing. The journalist, well, what's strange? Well, let me tell you what's strange. We're hooking up with young men in their 20s who can't perform sexually. In fact, there's an entire movement in Western culture, this is so sick and weird, that married couples cannot perform sexually, which is to say that the man in the relationship cannot get an erection and perform sexually unless while he's attempting to have sex with his wife, he's simultaneously watching porn in order to get aroused. That's the direction that the entire system is going. So the GQ article says, men, you should stop watching porn because if you keep watching it, I mean, I'm gonna say it to you rather straight and to the point. If you keep watching porn, you will find it impossible, men, at some point, and it'll gradually decline, and you will find it impossible to be aroused in the presence of an actual naked woman you will not be able to have a relationship 
with an actual female on a sexual level because your body will become gradually unresponsive to the stimuli of actual sex because you have so overstimulated your mind and your body with a level of sexual stimuli that doesn't exist in your world. So he gives number two, users feel controlled rather than in control. Somebody said to me, Ty, why are you sharing this? You're going to scare guys. They're going to be freaked out. And I believe the gospel, so I don't believe in scaring people into the kingdom. But I'm willing to terrify dudes out of watching porn. And if it takes threatening your capacity to perform sexually, I am urging you, apart from any moral standard or Christian mandate or God telling you or your parents or the church, forget all of that. You're not oppressed. You're destroying your actual physiology. You are destroying your capacity for sexual pleasure in your porn addiction. Number eight, I'm not giving you the whole list of 10, 34% of porn users report that their taste in porn becomes more and more deviant. I mean, it's like, I don't know, this is an Adventist group, so you didn't grow up in my world, but I remember very distinctly that when I was 12 years old and I drank a single beer, I was drunk. By the time I was 16, it would take two six-packs of beer to get the same buzz that I got when I would drink one beer at 12 years of age. The same holds true for all stimuli and addictions. Even Playboy magazine has decided in favor of clothing. Scott Flanders, Playboy CEO, reported that you're now one click away from every sex act imaginable for free, and so it's just passe at this juncture. So their subscriptions were declining, and they said, let's stop showing pictures of naked women, and let's do something else to try to raise our subscriptions. What did they decide to do? Well, the board of Playboy magazine voted unanimously, hey, we have an idea. Let's start publishing intelligent articles about the world and see if anybody wants to read them but no more objectification of women. Playboy magazine. Einstein said, and it's, I think this is almost prophetic, I don't think he was a prophet, but this is kind of prophetic. He said, this is before the internet was invented, he said, I fear the day that technology will surpass human interaction. I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Speaking of idiots, there's a boy band that has since disintegrated. Well, don't clap for them yet. Okay, so, so this, this band, of course, has disintegrated. And, and this is like the epitome of idiocy that you're witnessing here. Here's one of the most popular songs on the planet, and I'm not sharing it with you to make fun of them. Um, I'm sharing it with you honestly, because of the philosophical content of one of the most popular songs uh, a few years ago when this boy band was at the height of its success. I want you to track with the sentiments here because this is, this is the culture. I might never be your knight in shining armor. Well, that's kind of poetic, but what does that mean? Don't expect me to be courageous. I'm not going to ever rescue you. If somebody approaches on the street to mug us, I'm going to throw you to them and run. <laughs> Okay, is this the kind of man you want to be with? Do you want to be with a one direction kind of boy? <laughs> okay. Don't expect courage out of me. Okay, the, the song goes on. And I might never be uh, one to bring you flowers. I mean, they cost too much. I'm not going to spend any of my hard-earned money to, to give you flowers. So don't expect courage, verse 1. Don't expect any kind of romance. I'm, I'm just not into it. I might never be the hand you can put your heart into. Definitely don't trust me. I'm not the kind of guy you can, you know, give your heart to. Or the arms to hold you anytime you want. No, it's going to be when I want. 
not when you want. Let's make this very clear. The nature of this relationship is pure narcissism, and I'm the king on the throne, and uh, when I want you, I'll text you. When I'm done with you, I'll text you. This is the idea. But I can be the one. I can be the one tonight, and that's code for what? I'll have sex with you. Don't expect courage, romance. Don't trust me, but I'll have sex with you. This is the new man. And these guys are seated all around you, ladies, this moment. And my call to repentance for these guys sitting all around you is that, in fact, you would repent. Even if you don't want to be a Christian, these lyrics and these sentiments are extremely destructive. Girl, I hope you're sure you know what you're looking for. Because I'm not good at making promises. I'm not going to stay with you just so you know ahead of time. I'm willing to have sex with you, but I'm not going to stick around. So I'm going to suggest to you, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, maybe you could help me if you see me clicking and it doesn't move. So, so the, I'm going to summarize the song. Sin is stupid. It's idiotic. It leads to destructive patterns, sin, sin, sex as an end in itself always falls short of delivering what it promises. I'm just going to pause there for a minute. I really want you to, to process this, okay? I really want you to process this. Sex as an end in itself always falls short of delivering what it promises, let me tell you a very sad experience. I was speaking at a big camp recently, just a, a few months back. This young lady, she's 17 years old. She comes to me. She says, can we talk? I say, sure. She says, well, I'm considering baptism. I'd like to talk about baptism. Well, that's her cover. So yeah, let's talk about baptism. So she talks about baptism for a few minutes. And then she explains to me that just two days ago, at big camp, on this piece of property, one young man forced me to have sex with him, and then the next day brought his friend, and they both did it to me. And when they were done, they said, you wanted it. Remember that. And they walked off. We're living in a culture right now where every young man on this planet needs to be called to a higher standard. And I'm looking into your eyes right now, whoever you are, dude. And I'm telling you, in the authority of Jesus, to keep your hands and your lips off of God's daughters. Leave them alone. So I want to share with you on a positive note what I'm going to refer to as the love complex. Now, in our language, the English language, we're kind of handicapped with the word love. We just have the word love. I mean, we don't even really have synonyms for it. We can't look up. We don't have other options. So I can say to you in one breath, I can say to you, oh, I love skateboarding. I love tacos and I love my wife. And you have to do the hard work of sorting out the distinction between my wife and tacos. <laughs> because I only have one word, and the word is love. But in the Greek language, there were a minimum of four words. In other words, love was considered to be a complex of intersecting realities. First of all, there's that aspect of love that our culture is obsessed with, eros, from which we get the English word erotic. This is aesthetic love. This is, I'm attracted to you. This is, you're beautiful to look at. I like the way you look. I like the, the curves, the shape. I, I love your hair color, your eye color. The, the composite that you are, I'm experiencing some kind of physical attraction to you. This is eros. This is physical love. But then there's another kind of love, another dimension of love that the Greeks had a word for, and that word was phileo, which means friendship love or emotional love or affection. 
It has nothing to do with sexual attraction. It is, wow, I like your personality. I like the way you think. I, I'd love to have a conversation with you. You're, you're, you're fun to be with. And then there's storge, which was the word that the Greeks used for familial love or family love. This is where you commit for life and you have children and nanas and papas and aunties and uncles and, and you have a family. You build a history together. You build memories together. This is story. And then there's something called agape. Agape is, in a sense, kind of stern because it's unilateral, which is to say it's one way. Agape is volitional love. You know the word volitional? Volitional means it is the love of will, of willpower. I choose to love you, right? Till death do us part. Regardless of what in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer. This very lofty concept that I'm committing to you for life, come what may. Whatever befalls us, we're in this together to the end. Now, if you have agape love, that kind of commitment, volitional kind of love, now this is the key, this is what I'm going to share with you. This is the payoff, this is the point. If a, if a couple come together with volitional love, that is to say, the love of will, the love of commitment. Here's what happens psychologically. As the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, the months turn into years, that agape love produces a level of security. He's not going anywhere. He's still here. Sometimes I wish he wasn't here, but lo and behold, he still is. Oh, she's still here. We just had some really hard times. We lost everything, and she's still here. Apparently, she's not in it for the money. Wow, he's still here, even though I got really sick and had to have surgery, and he prepared the meals that needed to be delivered to me in bed, and we couldn't even have sex for months and he's still here. Wow, there's something going on. He must love me. So what's happening as those days turn into weeks and the weeks turn, what happens you go through what, what sometimes we refer to as the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs of life. Life goes up and down and what happens as gradually you realize, wow, she's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. He's committed. She's committed. What happens? Well, psychologically, what happens is that your capacity for vulnerability in the sexual realm of life becomes more open. In other words, I'll say it to you this way, you become more sexually free and available the more secure you are in the relationship. And this is why all the sociological studies indicate that couples report that the sex actually gets better as they stay married for five and then 10 and then, I don't wanna look in that direction. I don't know who said that. I just don't even wanna encounter that. Okay, so, <laughs> can I get a hallelujah? Okay, so. Okay, don't, don't, don't miss the science here. Here's the science. When a couple first gets married, when they begin to realize that there's things like commitment and trust and permanence and devotion and, I mean, this is the fact of the matter. If you serve one another in the bad times and psychologically you get the subliminal message that he's in this for more than that. She's in this for more than that. Right? I mean, let's be honest. If you marry for money, you're a prostitute. Just to be clear. And that is not an exaggeration for effect. So if you go through the relationship and it builds and it builds and it builds and you know that commitment is there, what's happening? You're becoming more at ease, more trusting, more vulnerable, more sexually free and available. 
Are you, tra- are you understanding the science here? So what's happening is the pleasure capacity is actually rising because sex is more than a physical act. It is also a psychological and emotional act. So all of these four dimensions of love, when they intersect, produce a level of capacity for happiness and joy and pleasure that can never be experienced by the one night stand, by the Amanda's explanation Uh, eight months and he's not my boyfriend. We've had sex 47 times, but he's not my boyfriend. Amanda and whoever that boy is will never ever enter in to the real pleasure that is available at a whole different level for a heart and mind that is in sync with its body, with trust and commitment and vulnerability. So, sex, I'm suggesting to you, transcends itself. The physical act of sex transcends itself by pointing to love. The real issue is love, not sex. There's nothing more pleasurable that a human being can ever experience than to grow old with the same person for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. One of the most beautiful things you will ever witness is a man who looks like he could die any minute, flirting with a woman who looks like she could die any minute. (laughs) And you know for a fact they're not having sex. How could they be? And yet, (laughs) sorry. You gotta make these points somehow, all right. And yet, it's the most beautiful thing in the world to see them having breakfast together and enjoying one another's company. Like, wow, how long have you been together? Approximately forever. And you still love each other? Yes, we do. Well, what are you gonna do today? We're just gonna hang out with one another. We're gonna have breakfast, and then we're gonna go on a walk on the beach, we're gonna talk about stuff, we're gonna laugh together. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. All Christian moralism and religion and the church dictating to you, all of that aside, what I just described to you, I'm telling you, that's what you want. And you need to hold out for it. You need to hold out for it because sin, sex transcends itself by pointing to love. So let me just go to the Bible now, not to prove anything to you, but to make a connection. In Song of Solomon, This is a beautiful poem, it's a song actually, where the man and the woman are describing their their love for one another back and forth with a beautiful poetic cadence. It just goes back and forth, it's incredible. And then the poem reaches its point of climactic realization of something that transcends even the beauty of the relationship between the man and the woman. And here's here's the crescendo point of the poem, all right? Are you ready for this? They've been saying, oh, I love you. No, I love you more. Oh, you're amazing. He says incredible stuff to her. He says, oh, your head is like a mountain. <laughs> he says, your waist is like a heap of wheat. These are th- I'm quoting to you from the book. This is what it says. Your eyes remind me of horses' eyes. This is the kind of romantic stuff you said back then. And after all that, I love you. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. Oh, you're amazing. No, you're more amazing. Here's the point. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, and jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. And the word there is Yahweh. What just happened is that in this beautiful romantic love song, we have a transition from romantic human love transitioning into, wow, the love of Yahweh is better than all of this. And then the next verse, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would offer for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Wow. 
How is that not attractive? How is that not attractive? A young man said to me recently, as we were talking about this subject, he said, it just sounds so inconvenient. It just sounds like a lot of, a lot of self-control. I, I just want to party. I just want to, I just want to have some fun. And I responded to this young man. I said, if you really want to have some fun, if you really want to have some fun, find a really, really cool girl with good character committed to Jesus that you're also attracted to, marry her, and stay committed to her for the rest of your life if you really want to have some fun. Now, if you want to dabble in this sub-par fun, of hooking up with whoever is willing to hook up with you. Well, go for it. But the lifespan of your fun is maybe 28 years old, maybe 30, and you're going to be a miserable wreck of a human being who can't even get an erection. I looked straight into his eyes and said that with an emphasis on erection. You're not even going to be able, by the time you're 28, you won't even be able to get an erection, I said to him. And he was like, what? So I scared him into monogamy. <laughs> In closing, I'm suggesting to you that sex at its best is a window, according to Song of Solomon, what we just read, according to other passages of Scripture I don't have time to get into, but that sex at its best is really a window of understanding into God's love. The gospel is the process by which God redeems pleasure as the thriving byproduct of love. Listen, it's love you want, not sex. It's sex you want with love. But you don't want sex without love. You think you do. You're deluded. And you're headed for trouble. Good sex is a window into God's love. Jesus understood this. And he said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The word know here is the Old Testament word when it says in Genesis 5, Adam knew his wife Eve and she got pregnant. He knew her and she got pregnant? Well, how did he know her? This is the poetic word for sex. Women do not get pregnant. Some men here are really ignorant. I'm just going to tell you. Women don't get, get pregnant by being contemplated. <laughs> so he didn't know her in the sense of just like, hey, how are you? My name's Adam. Well, I'm Eve. No, he knew her intimately in the sexual act. Jesus takes that word from the Old Testament, and he brings it into the New Testament. He says, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You know this beautiful, amazing thing that happens between a man and a woman when they get married and commit to one another for life, that intimacy that is only accessible in that matrimonial contact, you know that thing? Everybody's going, yeah? Jesus says, well, God wants something like that, but not that with you. Eternal life is a quality of life that derives its meaning from knowing or intimacy mentally, emotionally, with God. That's what the plan of salvation is really all about, which brings us to the point of our time together, and that is that strawberries are sweet, and strawberries are a way that we can understand the physiology of pleasure. If I happen to have before you here today a freshly picked bowl of strawberries, and I said to you, you haven't eaten anything for like two hours, three hours, ten days, and I say to you, here, have a strawberry and you pluck a strawberry out of my strawberry bowl, and you put it in your mouth, and I ask you the question, what do you think? Is it sweet? What are you going to say? What? Who are you? Somebody said, no. You don't like strawberries, apparently. You love them. Okay, so our, I'm asking you a, a, an actual question. Are strawberries in and of themselves sweet? Do they have an actual sugar content? Are strawberries sweet? Especially if you haven't eaten for a few hours, Strawberries are intrinsically, in and of themselves, what? Sweet. So, yeah, your answer is they're sweet. And then I have another bowl, and it's full of bite-sized Tim Tams. You have, is that over here, or that's Australia? Bite-sized Snickers bars, 
Sugar cubes. I don't know. What do you have over here that's sickly sweet? What? Okay, you have something in this bowl. <laughs> like little candy bars that are sickly sweet. So you just swallowed that delightful strawberry, and then I say, yeah, have one of these. No, have two. Have three. And you just pop one whatever after another into your mouth. Snickers bar, Tim Tam, what, you're just popping. Oh, and then as soon as you're done swallowing the sickly sweet candy bar, I say, have another strawberry. And you pluck one and you put it in your mouth and I ask you, is it sweet? What's your answer now? No, it's not sweet, it's tart, it's sour. Why? Question, has anything changed in the nature of the strawberry? No, where did the change occur? In your mouth. You now, by taking into your, and I'm not against Tim Tams or whatever's in your bowl, have at it. It's an illustration that an extremely over-the-top sugar source makes a natural sugar source not taste sweet at all. Isn't that how it works? Well, here's the bottom line. Sex, as God designed sex to operate, is extremely sweet. But sexual promiscuity and hookup culture and having sex without meaning and without feelings gradually diminishes the human capacity for pleasure. And Paul says that what happens is that in a repeated sexual promiscuity, you come to a place where you're past feeling. You can't feel anymore. Pleasure without love gradually kills the capacity for pleasure itself. C.S. Lewis said it this way, sin is an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. This is called the law of diminishing returns. Our culture is experiencing the apocalypse of human dating system and sexuality while all the while God is pro-strawberries, pro-pleasure, pro-sex, pro-family, and pro-love. God's the inventor of all of this and the popular culture with its tendency toward hookup culture and swiping right or left is in the process of trying to steal the capacity for love from an entire generation. And you are that generation. And you need to make a decision whether you're going to allow this culture to steal the capacity for love from you. Thanks.